Hello and welcome to season one of Romance with Heart and Heat, your podcast and YouTube show for contemporary rom-com audiobook serials. My name is Marie Matthew and I'm the author of the stories you're going to hear on this channel. The title of season one is The Bad Girl List and this is a fake dating, second chance rom-com set in California wine country. Find out how one life-changing vacation list puts the heart of Dominique Chen on the line when she meets sexy wine grower Trevor Moretti. The content of this channel is intended for audience members that are 18 years and older. There is some explicit content on this channel, there is light swearing, and there are some explicit spicy scenes. So I don't want any surprises as people move into the story so you have been warned. Be sure to stick around at the end of each episode for author commentary. And if you have any questions or comments, you can drop them into the comments section in YouTube, or you can also send me an email at romancingmarie at gmail.com. I'll do my best to answer questions and comments in future episodes on the show. Please like and subscribe to my channel on your favorite platform, whatever that happens to be. And please help me spread the word and share the show with your friends. Now, as you're listening along, if you get to the point where the tension's too much and you just can't wait to find out what happens next, you can head over to mariematthew.com and you can purchase the complete season of The Bad Girl List over on my website. It's available in ebook format, audiobook format, and there's also autographed hardbacks and paperbacks. So you will get the entire season for free on YouTube and the podcast. But again, if you just can't wait, head over to mariematthew.com. Thanks so much for listening. And now it's time for some romance with heart and heat. I hope you enjoy. Chapter 25. Skyview Villa. Dominique. I hadn't thought about the wisdom of getting high before seeing Trevor again. Turns out it had been a brilliant move. Brilliant. All my worries about what I was going to say or how I would act went out the window in exchange for holding his hand. There's no trace of any awkwardness between us now. I'm not sure how long we wander around in the dark forest. Trevor gets us lost a few times, forcing us to backtrack at least twice. He refuses to let us use the lights on our phones because he doesn't want anyone to see us. Thomas gives him endless shit for every time we take a wrong turn, but Trevor ignores him and doggedly keeps us floundering around in the woods. Since he's with me and holding my hand, I really couldn't care less about how long we bumble around in the dark. Or at least, that's what I think at first. But I'm starting to get cold. I'd been warm in the car and hadn't thought to put on my jacket when we headed out into the woods for this crazy adventure. In nothing but a tank top and cargo pants, I'm already covered in goosebumps. The saran wrap around my middle crinkles as I move. By the time we finally arrive at the fence that Trevor claims is the backside of Skyview Villa, I'm covered in a light sheen of sweat and even colder. My body is also buzzing with the knowledge that, very soon, I'm going to be naked in a pool with Trevor Moretti. This way, Trevor beckons us along the side of a tall wooden fence. We stop when we reach an old redwood tree stump. This is the way in, he whispers, patting the stump. On the other side of the fence is an air conditioning unit. You can use it as a step to get down. Trevor goes first. When I scramble after him, he helps me down on the other side. I find myself in an alleyway between the fence and a building. His hands around my waist linger there longer than strictly necessary. I take advantage of the moment to look up into his eyes, wondering if he'll kiss me tonight. He tightens his grip on my waist, crinkling the saran wrap beneath my clothes. Dom. Whatever he's about to say is cut short as Thomas hops up on the fence and scrambles over. Trevor gives me one last squeeze before releasing me. Once everyone else is over, we follow Trevor in a single file line until we bump up against the back of a large bush. Trevor has me by the hand. We squeeze between the corner of the building and the bush and emerge onto a breathtaking sight. The moon nearly full sits high in the sky, illuminating everything with bright light. There's a cabana off to our left. Behind us is what looks like a hotel cottage built entirely from stone with a slate roof. Vines crawl along the walls. A wide infinity pool sits in front of us, the waters rippling in a slight breeze. Beyond the pool is a sweeping moonlit vista of vineyards far below us in a valley. Your sense of direction has been redeemed. Thomas slaps Trevor on the shoulder. And can I just say you are a fucking ass for never telling me about this before? Last one in is a rotten egg, Minnie Whisper shouts, already stripping out of her clothes. I shoot a look at Trevor. Our eyes meet. He releases my hand and peels off his shirt. A thrill of excitement goes through me at the idea of seeing him completely naked, and of him seeing me naked. I take a little longer to undress than strictly necessary. I have a perfect view of Trevor's naked backside for exactly 10 seconds. His ass looks like it was lifted from a Greek statue. His back is hard and well-muscled. The moonlight pours across his body and turns the two hollows above his ass cheeks to dark pools. 
then he slips into the water, dunking his head and disappearing from sight. I finish undressing, leave my clothes in a neat stack on the side of the pool, and hurry to the edge. My entire middle is wrapped with saran wrap, by order of Chrissy. Not only am I saran wrapped, but white medical tape runs along the top and bottom to prevent any seepage. It probably looks weird as hell, but since Trevor has a tattoo, I figure I don't have to explain it to him. I'm shivering even more now. The idea of getting into a cold pool does not sound appealing, but I'm fully committed to seeing this through. Trevor surfaces just as I test the water with the tip of my toes. A jolt of electricity goes through me as his eyes drag up my naked body. Warmth pulls between my legs, and then I'm shivering for an entirely different reason. I want to jump in and end my pain, but I can't risk making noise and giving us away. Instead, I sit on the edge and dangle both legs in the water. Trevor has taken a sudden interest in the moon. I hold my breath and slip over the side. A hiss passes over my teeth as the water hits my already cold body. Crap. I manage to keep the expletive to a whisper. Trevor turns around and swims in my direction. Refreshing, isn't it? If feeling like an iceberg is considered refreshing, then yes. He chuckles. Come on, swim around with me. It will get your blood flowing. I paddle over to him, the two of us moving to the deep end. Annika, Minnie and Thomas are in the shallow end, the three of them engaged in a game of what I can only surmise as truth or dare. Thomas is doing naked push-ups on the side of the pool, while Annika and Minnie look like they might come apart with laughter. My teeth rattle, the cold seeming to sink into my bones. Are you warming up yet? Trevor lazily treads water beside me. Droplets gleam on the tips of his golden hair. Up here under the open sky with the moon like a brilliant beacon, I snatch another look at his gorgeous body beneath the water. I'd love to draw him. What? I ask realizing he had just said something. My teeth give another loud rattle. Are you warming up yet? A little. Another shiver shakes my body but I don't think Trevor noticed. Minnie gets out of the pool and executes a perfect firefly yoga pose on the pool deck. Annika pretends to clap her hands. Thomas looks like his eyes might come out of his head. I glance in Trevor's direction to see his reaction to this spectacular display of yoga prowess, but he's not looking at Minnie. He's looking at me. You're still cold, he says. I'm fine. My teeth chatter as I say this. He hesitates then says, come here. The water splashes as he holds out a hand. I take it. He pulls me into his side, his hand coming around my saran-wrapped waist. I forgot about needing to keep a new tattoo dry. The warmth of his hand seeps into my skin through the plastic as it splays across my hip and stomach. What did you get? You'll have to wait and see, I reply, teasing. His gaze is heated when he says, I look forward to it. He's tall enough that he can stand, whereas I float in his grip. His skin is hot against my side, but it doesn't warm me all the way. Another shiver of cold quivers through me. Shit, you're freezing, he says. Would you believe me if I told you this is a semi-normal state for me? All the women in my family are cold-blooded. A long moment passes. I keep my eyes up on the moon, letting the shivers roll through me, trying not to bring attention to it. The water stirs as Trevor moves. He steps behind me and pulls me to his front, his broad chest curling around my back as he holds me. The tip of his erection bulges against my bottom. Sorry. He adjusts me so that I can't feel that part of him, inching my bottom so that it nestles higher against his abdomen. Side effect of having a beautiful girl naked in the pool with me. I instinctively arch into his warmth. Both his arms wrap around me as he hugs me against him. This would have been a hell of a lot better without the saran wrap, but nothing short of a fire alarm could ruin this moment for me. Better? His breath feathers against my ear. Yeah. It's the only sound I'm capable of making. I'm afraid that if I try to speak, nothing but babble will come out. My body might be cold on the outside, but on the inside, I'm turning into a volcano. On the other side of the pool, Minnie, Thomas, and Annika are all sitting on one of the steps, the water lapping around their waists. With their breasts free and glowing under the moon, Minnie and Annika look like Playboy bunny models. Thomas is practically in Candyland with two beautiful naked women sitting next to him. Do you still want potato chips? Trevor's lips graze the shell of my ear. I want you. The thought skitters across my brain. My body is electrified, the current growing with a momentum that's making it hard for me to think. I don't think I'm high anymore. The effects of my two hits off the joint had worn off on the hike here, though my body still feels pleasantly relaxed. That doesn't mean I'd turn down potato chips if you offered them to me though. Next time we break into a pool to go skinny dipping, I'll pack a picnic. Now I know he's flirting. I'm going to hold you to that, I say. Thomas grabs Minnie and pulls her in for a long sensuous kiss. Minnie rewards him with a nibble on the ear, then shocks the hell out of me by grabbing Annika and kissing her on the mouth. Annika lets out a gasp of surprise, but Minnie holds onto her. Thomas, not to be deterred, puts his arms around both women and draws them in. It's not long before all three of them are making out together. There would have been a time when what I'm witnessing my cousin do would have sent me running for cover. Or at the very least, grabbing the nearest pair of earmuffs and a blindfold. 
but all it does is heighten my awareness of Trevor. The lava inside me is rising up. Trevor's hands tighten around me, the stubble of his chin brushing my shoulder. Neither of us says anything as things heat up between Minnie, Thomas, and Annika. I close my eyes and lean my head back against his shoulder. His scruff rubs against my temple. Time becomes elastic, each moment stretching out in what almost feels like agony. There's a three-way unfolding in front of me but my vision is blurred, all my attention on the way his breath feels against my neck. Trevor, I want you. I almost say the words. I want to say them so badly. I want you to be my vacation fling, my one-night stand, my boy toy and my fuck buddy. I want you any way I can have you. When I turn my head to look at him, I find myself nose to nose with him. Trevor. His name slips between my lips. Yeah? My brain scrambles as his dark eyes lock with mine. I forgot what I was going to say. His soft laugh vibrates against my back. That's the pot. It can make you scatterbrained. It's not the pot. It's the heat throbbing between my legs. It's his hard muscles against my back and strong biceps holding me tightly against him. I've never wanted to kiss someone so badly in my entire life. But before we'd left the VRBO, before I took my first hit of pot, and before I ended up naked in the pool with Trevor Moretti, I had decided to let him take the lead tonight. He's the one with the hang-ups, which means he needs to set the pace. This pact I'd made with myself is the only thing that keeps me from diving on him like a piranha in heat. I break eye contact. How's tequila? Tequila? She told me she wanted a career change. What? I have no idea what he means. She wants to take up superheroing. It takes a few seconds for his joke to penetrate. My laugh when it finally comes is breathy. My breasts jiggle the water. Was my joke that bad, he asks, rubbing his chin gently against my head. I lean into the pressure of his chin. No, it was a good joke. My brain is just slow. Because he is so, so distracting. And maybe because I still have a little weed in my bloodstream. Is superheroing a real word? Definitely. I looked it up before I came tonight. I've been planning that joke all day. Forehead crinkling with amusement, I turn to look at him. You are so weird, says the girl who drew my three-legged dog as a superhero. You put the idea into her head, not me. You know I didn't plan that joke, right? Yeah, I got that, I reply. I did spend the entire day thinking about you, though. His words send a sharp spear of desire through me. A soft moan escapes my lips. A growl rumbles up from Trevor's throat in response. Without warning, he flips me around, pulling my front against his. My nipples tingle from the contact. I stop breathing as his eyes lock with mine. Is this okay? His voice is husky. Yeah, I wrap my legs around his waist, my breaths making the water stutter around me. Trevor shifts me in his arms. The tip of his erection brushes my core before he gets me settled a little higher on his waist. The brief contact is almost enough to make me spontaneously combust. Did you know a new season of Survivor started this past weekend, he asks. I shake my head. No, I had to cancel my television subscriptions when Oliver moved out. I heard my mom and dad talking about it after Sunday dinner. They recorded it on their DVR. He leans forward, resting his forehead against mine. Sorry I'm rambling. I'm nervous. He's nervous? That makes two of us, I say. The tip of his cock presses against me a second time. This time, Trevor doesn't readjust me. Just when I didn't think my heart could race any faster, he proves me wrong. You do things to me. He cups the side of my face, running his thumb along my cheekbone. I wait to see what he'll do, sticking firm to my resolve to let him take the lead. I want him inside me so badly but I know I can't push. If Trevor is going to be my number 10, he has to come to it on his own. It must be pretty damn obvious that I want him. I have no idea how condoms work in swimming pools but I'm beyond caring. I have an IUD. I'll take Trevor however I can get him, however much he'll give me. He continues to hold me, the tip of his erection still pressing against me. His hand slides past my ear to gently free my hair from its buns. I close my eyes, enjoying the feel of his fingers sliding through my strands. His forehead still rests against mine. I vaguely notice that Annika and the others have migrated to the cabana. Soft sounds come from inside. Dom. Trevor whispers my name, his hand winding around my hair. He tilts my head back, forcing me to look at him. His eyes move between me and my mouth. All the while his cock presses against me hard enough to let me know it's there but not hard enough to slide inside me. I meet his gaze, willing for him to see how much I want him, how wet I am for him. Everything below my belly button throbs for him. I'm so aroused that I might need a fire hose to douse myself. Trevor hasn't even kissed me, and I'm practically coming apart at the seams. I want him to take me up against the side of the pool and fuck me senseless. I want him on the pool deck, on a lounge chair, up against the side of the cottage wall, and, hey who's in there? Everything comes to a screeching halt. My lusty haze dissolves, reality leaping back into focus. Who's in there? The voice speaks a second time. The world crashes back in around me with startling clarity. A flashlight beam cuts through the darkness. If someone's in there, I'm calling the police. This is private property. I glimpse bodies scurrying through the darkness, heading back to the fence. 
It's Annika, Thomas, and Minnie, all of them buck naked as they scurry for their clothes. They're trying to stay quiet, but snickers keep erupting. Shit, we gotta go. Trevor hauls me toward the edge of the pool. I break free and swim the rest of the way, not even bothering to conceal my splashes as I hear a key rattling in the gate. Right as Trevor and I pull ourselves out of the water, the security guard bursts in. Who says you need a plus one for a satisfying date night? Meet Hello Date Night, the book box that contains everything you need for a perfect night of pleasure. Each box comes with an autographed copy of The Bad Girl List, a discreet feminine pleasure toy with a matching travel bag, and a sensual rose candle. Say yes to your perfect date night and head over to mariematthew.com to purchase this limited edition book box today. Chapter 26. Saran Wrap. Trevor. I don't know what I'm doing. That's not exactly accurate. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm holding Dom flush against my chest. Her legs are around me, her nipples are hard, and my dick is pressed up right against her hot pussy. My hand is in her loose hair, and I'm loving the feel of her against me, even if there is a large amount of saran wrap between my hand and her skin. I'm hard as a rock, and it's all I can do not to maul her right here in the pool. Seeing her strip down on the pool deck has left my head screwy. I knew the plan was for skinny dipping, yet somehow I hadn't realized just how bright it would be beneath the moon in Villa Chanticleer. I hadn't expected to have a complete view of Dawn from head to toe, her skin lit up like she was under a spotlight. It would be an understatement to say her baggy cargo pants don't do her justice but somehow that makes it all the more sexy. She's petite and curvy and perfect. I want to put my hands all over her. I want her, but I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing and fucking up the delicate balance between us. Everything is so perfect. She's here naked with me. It feels like any move I make has the potential to bring everything crashing down. So I hold her in place, the tip of my cock pulsing as I feel the promise of her heat, her mouth so close that I could claim it. Meanwhile my brother is living out his greatest fantasy. Turns out that while Annika and Thomas were busy plotting to help Thomas hook up with Minnie, Minnie was busy plotting how to hook up with Annika. Now all three of them have disappeared into the canvas-covered cabana in the far corner of the pool deck. From the sound of things they're having fun. Having sex on display does nothing to help my arousal. I turn us so we're facing away from the cabana, hoping the three of them don't get us kicked out with their shenanigans. Dom is still quiet. The top of her breasts curve out of the water. I can feel reason leaving the building as I watch the water gently rise and fall around them. My hands tense as I fight the temptation to touch them. Dom. I tilt her head back to look at me. My cock throbs from the heat I see in her eyes. She has no idea how much I want to dig my fingers in her hips and shove my dick inside her. I want her hot pussy to surround me, to consume me. I want to suck on her nipples and make her moan. I want to throw her on the pool deck and go down on her. I want to fuck her backwards and forwards and lose myself in her. From the way she's looking at me, I think she might want that too. What would she say if I told her I brought condoms with me tonight, on the off chance things went well between us? I wet my lips, trying to work up the nerve to take the next step, to risk breaking this perfect moment. Hey who's in there? My head jerks toward the sound. Dom bolts in my arms. From the cabana comes a series of harsh whispers to be quiet and shut up, which of course just makes more noise. Who's in there? I glimpse the head of the security guard on the other side of the bushes. If someone's in there, I'm calling the police. This is private property. Annika, Thomas and Minnie burst out of the cabana, all of them naked as they make a beeline for their clothes. They're about as quiet as a kindergarten class hopped up on sugar. Shit, we gotta go. Still holding on to Dom, I push for the side of the pool. She breaks free of me and swims for the side. Thomas and the others have disappeared into the alleyway. As Dom and I haul ourselves out of the pool, the security guard bursts into the yard. Dom lets out a squeak of alarm, grabs her pile of clothes and takes off. Her saran wrap bandage has come partially undone in the water, a long trail of it flapping behind her as she runs. I'm right on her heels, bundling my clothes in a wad under my arm. I'm treated to a perfect view of her smoking hot ass as she ducks under the bushes, heading for the air conditioning unit. I got you. I drop my clothes and grab her around the waist, hoisting her onto the unit. Thomas is buck naked on the other side, holding out a hand from his position on the tree stump. Minnie and Annika are in the shadows of the woods, hurriedly pulling on their clothes. Dom scrambles to the top of the fence, reaching her arms out for Thomas. A piece of her saran wrap snags on the wood as she lets go and lands in my brother's outstretched hands. A shockwave of irritation goes through me as Thomas's hands close around her waist. There isn't time to be jealous. I can hear the security guard on his radio, calling for backup. I throw my clothes over the fence and scramble after them. Thomas bolts into the cover of the trees, but Dom waits for me. Her face is a mixture of delight and horror as the security guard lumbers into the alleyway. Come on Trev, she hisses, grabbing my hand. 
I pause long enough to swipe up my clothes, then take her outstretched hand and run. We pelt into the shadows of the trees, our bare feet crunching on small pine cones and needles. I'm too exhilarated to feel the pain, but I know my feet will pay the price for this. I glance down at Dom as we weave around a cluster of ferns and pass some manzanita trees. Her long hair sends out long streamers of water. Her breasts bounce as she runs. Her nipples are hard and tight from the cold air. The fucking strip of saran wrap is getting tangled around her legs. My erection immediately returns. Apparently, even when running through a forest after a near miss with a security guard, I'm not immune to her. Fuck I want her. Oh my god. Dom draws to a halt in a cluster of tall redwood trees, both hands flying to her mouth to smother a laugh but her shoulders shake with mirth. Oh my god I can't believe we did that. Her eyes are bright, her smile wide. She looks wild, exhilaration shining from her face when she looks at me. That was so fun. Even in the thick shadows of the trees, I can see her perfectly. Her smile, her eyes, her body. Everything. My brain stops working. My hands act on their own accord, like someone else is driving the wheel. I take her face between my hands and kiss her. She tastes like pot and laughter and chlorine water. The combination is like a jumper cable to my dick. When I pull her to me, there is no hesitation. She melts against me, her hands raking down my ribcage and up my back. I try to touch every part of her at once. Her face. Her neck. Her breasts. Her hips. Her ass. Her skin is damp from the pool, already prickling from the cold air but it feels like silk under my hands. I want her. It's the only rational thought I can form through the roaring in my ears. I drop to my knees in front of her so that I'm eye level with her perfect breasts. I take one of them in my mouth, sucking and rolling my tongue over her nipple. I take the other one with my hand, massaging it. Trevor. I love the way she gasps my name, the way she weaves her fingers into my hair. It's all just more fuel to my near frenzied state. I release her nipple from my mouth, tilting my head up to look at her. The sweet slightly awkward girl is gone. In front of me is a woman in the grips of lust. Her eyes are dilated, her lips parted, and when she breathes my name it makes my dick throb. I want you, she whispers. In response I slip my hand between her legs. She's dripping, but it's not from the pool water. I'm seized with a need to feel her. I slide two fingers into her opening. She arches into me, her eyes on my face. Her pussy is warm and slick. Her walls ripple and spasm around me as I sink into her, and I realize she's right on the edge of coming. My mind flashes back to the pool, to how she'd looked at me before we'd been interrupted. Something feral ignites inside me as I realize she'd been as turned on as I'd been. I wanna see you come. My voice is guttural as my eyes lock with hers. Come for me Dom. Her eyelids flutter. Her walls clamp around my touch. I see the moment when she tumbles over the edge. Her body writhes as the orgasm rolls through her. My free hand grips her ass as I pump my fingers into her, drinking in the feel of her slick pleasure coating my skin. She's so fucking sexy. I'm far from done with her. As soon as her body stills, I trail kisses down her middle, starting with the spot between her breasts and going down. I lick and suck at her skin, and stop when I run into that fucking saran wrap. It's still clinging to her. This needs to go. I fumble at it, trying to tear it off, but it gets stuck around her middle. Oh hell. Dom tugs at it. I think Annika may have outdone herself. Hold on. With one hand I grab the dangling end and wrap it around my fist. With the other I cup her ribcage and turn her. She gets the idea. She laughs softly as her bare feet turn in the dirt. I grin. This is better than unwrapping a Christmas present. I caress her with my free hand as she spins, trailing my fingers lightly over her breasts, her collarbone, her back and her ass. I want to touch every part of her. The saran wrap quickly unwinds. I toss it aside. The bandage underneath is dark with dried blood and sticks to her hip. This isn't exactly sexy, she says, looking down at the bandage. Everything about you is sexy. I pull her against me, molding her body to mine as I kiss her. Her hands nod in my hair, then trail down my back and around my hips. She traces the ridges of my abs before running her fingers up the inside of my thighs. My dick is so hard it's starting to hurt. I want her so badly I can barely see straight. I lean her back, kissing the base of her throat, and sliding my palm over her breast and down to the bandage that sticks to her skin. I tug at it, wanting to see her tattoo. The bandage comes free with a gentle tug. I drop it to the ground, and kiss my way back down her body. I lick her belly button, then nip the taut surface of her stomach before finally making my way over to her hip. Dancing over her delicate hip bone are four blue butterflies. The sight of it is like hitting a brick wall in a car going 200 miles per hour. What the fuck is that? I jerk back from her as if she's just burned me. What? She takes a step back from me, eyes widening. What the fuck is that? My heart is pounding, my throat is tight, and suddenly I feel the weight of Elle's body in my lap as she died on the side of the road. The blue butterflies on her black dress glow in my memory. Trevor what's wrong? She reaches for me. I step out of reach and turn my back. My heart is beating so fast I can hardly breathe. I can feel Elle's warm blood on my hands and see the light leave her eyes. I feel the vibration of the storm and taste the lightning in the air. And those butterflies, those fucking butterflies. What the fuck are they doing on Dom? 
I retreat from Dom, taking shelter in the shadows as I struggle to get my breathing under control. I breathe out through my nose, counting down from 10, but only make it to 5 before Thomas's voice cuts through the night. Guys I see them. They're over here. It's like a bucket of cold water being poured over my head. A perfect image of Elle snaps into place and I see her, smiling on the beach in Hawaii, as we hold hands in the surf. The echo of her laugh sizzles through me. There you are. Annika trots into our clearing fully dressed. Her eyebrows lift in amusement as she takes us in. Did we interrupt something? No. Dom grabs her clothes from the forest floor, hastily pulling them on. No we were just looking for a place to get dressed. Annika studies us through narrowed eyes. I can't even look at Dom. Elle's laughter rolls through me like an ocean wave. My heart is still trying to beat its way out of my chest. Thomas and Minnie trot out of the dark. Hurry up bro, he says. Cops are on their way. We gotta get to the car. Somehow I find my way to my clothes. Dom has turned her back on me, pretending to be interested in something Minnie and Annika are saying, but her shoulders are stiff. Fuck. I have really fucked things up, but why the fuck did she have blue butterflies tattooed on her? What sort of sick twisted joke is this? I don't trust myself to speak. There's still a part of me sitting on the side of the road with Elle in my lap as the hurricane pounds the earth with tears. I walk at the front of the group, on the way back to Minnie's Corolla. I keep trying to count down from 10, but I can't focus well enough to get to zero. By the time the others catch up with me, I'm standing in front of the passenger door to claim my seat. I can't be stuffed into the back with Dom again. The ride back to the park is strained. Annika and Thomas occasionally giggle in the back, but Dom sits in potent silence. Shit. I royally screwed up tonight. How do I fix things? Do I want to fix things? Are things better off this way? When we get back to Thomas's Tesla, I get out without saying anything. Even if I had the mental capacity to form an apology, to explain what happened, I don't think words are enough. Thomas says something that makes the girls laugh. He waves goodbye as they drive away. Then he turns, gives me a look, and gets into the driver's seat. Thomas doesn't say a word the whole way home. He doesn't have to. I can feel his disapproval. Well fuck him. He's never lost someone the way I have. He doesn't understand. No one understands. Dom does. The words niggle at the back of my mind. She kept her distance as soon as I told her about L. She never once pushed things. In fact, if I'd let her, she would have walked out of my life and never looked back. Everything that's happened since then has been on me. The night of 20 questions at Platitude. The fake dinner date. Almost screwing her in the vineyard after the family dinner. Even in the pool I touched her first. I kissed her under the redwood trees. This realization makes me feel sick and miserable. I can feel the weight of Elle's body in my lap as she died. When Thomas pulls up in front of the bungalow, he turns to me. I hold up a hand as I get out of the car. I don't want to hear it. He just looks at me. I don't want to hear it, I repeat. What is it you don't want to hear, Thomas replies. That you finally met a girl who makes you feel something again, and you're fucking it all up. I don't know what happened back there but I saw Dom's face. You hurt her bro. You're right I'm fucking it up. She needs to stay away from me. Great idea. When you're old and lonely with only the ashes of a three-legged dog to keep you company, don't come whining to me. With that he throws the Tesla into reverse and drives off in a spew of dust. I storm inside. Tequila comes out of her crate, tail wagging as she hops in a circle around my feet. I absently pat her on the head before stomping over to my nightstand. I still love Elle, I tell my dog. Her tail stops wagging and her eyebrows droop. I can see the reprimand in her eyes. Dad you blew your chance with my second favorite person tonight, I say in my high-pitched tequila voice. What were you thinking? You're not helping, I tell my dog. The sketch of Super Tequila and my superhero truck is still propped in front of the framed picture of me and Elle. Seeing the drawing makes me feel like I have a thousand pounds on my chest. I open the drawer and fling it inside. My eyes land on the bottle of lube I keep there. I hadn't thought of it until now, but it's exactly what I need to get Dom out of my system. I unzip my jeans. My dick is still semi-hard from being in such close proximity to her naked body all night. I pour some lube on my hand and start to stroke myself picking up the picture of me and Elle from the nightstand. I have used this picture for this purpose plenty of times in the past two years. Elle in her bikini never fails to get me off, but it's different tonight. As I stare at it trying to relieve the pressure that's been building since the night I met Dom, my mind keeps wandering. The photograph might be right in front of me, but what I see is Dom's naked body on the pool deck at Villa Chanticleer. Her perky breasts, the curve of her hips and her long hair, even that fucking saran wrap around her middle was sexy as hell. My nostrils flare as I remember how wet she was when I slid my fingers inside her, how she tasted when I kissed her mouth. My blood heats and my heart rate rises. I try to focus on the picture of Elle, but every time I do, the world dissolves into memories of Dom. The way she felt against my chest when I held her in the pool. The way she looks when she's lost in one of her drawings. What it felt like to have her hands on me under the redwood trees. When I finally come, it's Dom's smile that hangs in front of me.
Hello everyone, welcome to the Marie Matthew Show. I am the author of The Bad Girl List, Marie Matthew, and welcome to the author commentary portion of the episode. I always like to start the episode by saying cheers and raising a glass to you guys. Today I'm not drinking wine, today I'm drinking decaf green tea. So my fuel for writing is green tea. It's like, I need it, I can't write without it. <laughs> um, I always start with an enormous mug of caffeinated green tea first thing in the morning and then I switch to decaf. So here I am drinking decaf. And I wanted to show you, if you're on YouTube, my adorable cup. From a distance, it looks like Wedgwood, which is, for those of you that don't know, Wedgwood is that classic blue and white porcelain. It's been around forever. I'm sure you can picture it in your head. But anyway, this looks like a Wedgwood mug but it's actually calamity wear. It's a cup with all these horrible things happening. <laughs> um, so there's like a killer frog. There's some kind of like a Bigfoot on the loose. There's a pirate ship attacking. There's a sea serpent, pterodactyl, uh, killer robots, some kind of man-eating lizard. And of course my favorite, the zombie poodle. <laughs> so anyway, it's called calamity wear. You can look at their website. They have a whole, a whole line of dishes. I just have the mug, they're kind of expensive. But this cup always makes me laugh because I look like I'm prim and proper when you're two feet away from me, but when you're up close, you can see um, how there's still a little apocalypse in my soul, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, cheers to you. And before we jump into the episode, I thought this would be fun. About a month ago, my husband was on a, a had a poker night with his friends. And so I was up late by myself and I was bored at scrolling Facebook. <laughs> what you do it late at night when you're bored you scroll Facebook and I totally got suckered into one of those Facebook ads you guys know what I'm talking about right it's always the second post when you first open your Facebook account there's something because you know their algorithms know what you like my husband always gets like UFO and MMA and WWF ads in his Facebook I get like chakra necklaces <laughs> brightly colored rugs stuff like that anyway so this came into my Facebook. It's my little bag of sweary affirmations. It's a funny little oracle deck. And so of course I bought it because I'm a sucker and I was home and I was up late bored by myself. But I thought, oh, this is, this is a kick. I'm gonna pick a card for the audience of the Marie Matthew Show and I'm gonna give you guys a little sweary affirmation for your day. Are you ready? Here we go. Okay, I have to hold it back a little bit because my eyes aren't great anymore. Okay, here's your affirmation for the day. I am my own best friend. Other people are total dicks. <laughs> uh, do you love it? Do you love it? I hope that gave you a smile and I hope that gave you a little, little boost on the inside. I am my own best friend. Other people are total dicks. There you go. There's your sweary affirmation for the day. Now we're gonna dive briefly into the behind the scenes of episode nine. And in this episode, Dom, Trevor, Annika, Thomas, and Minnie, they all break into the fancy hotel on top of Fitch Mountain. So I have to tell you, Fitch Mountain has like such a special place in my heart. It's an absolute landmark in Healdsburg. So if and when you come to visit, when you look up and you look east, there it is. You can't miss it. It's ginormous. It is the backdrop of Healdsburg and it's this beautiful mountain and I have such a special place in my heart because I used to be a long distance runner so I spent many mornings in total darkness and nothing but my headlamp like running laps around up and down Fitch Mountain. Um, <laughs> I love the way it smells, um, I love the trees up there, I love how quiet it is, I love the narrow beat up old roads and there is even a trail up there that goes to the top of the mountain and you can go to an overlook that overlooks all of Healdsburg. And that is a public trail. So if you do ever visit Healdsburg, I, I definitely recommend it for a hike. And it's not that far. It's maybe, maybe a mile up to the top, maybe less. I'm not sure, it's not that far, but the view is totally worth it. So it was really fun to write about Fitch Mountain in the book because it is a place that I totally love. The hotel that I described, it doesn't actually exist. There is no hotel on Fitch Mountain. There is a place called Villa Chanticleer and it's this really cool old, I'm gonna use the word compound. It's this old compound from the 70s. You can rent it for weddings, but it's like super old school, like the old wood and it's got like the big black wrought iron chandeliers on the inside, like 
total throwback. There is not really a hotel up there, I'm sorry. There are hotels in Healdsburg that do charge $3,000 a night. That was not made up. <laughs> but there's no hotel on Fitch Mountain. But uh, yeah, definitely a place that is near and dear to my heart. The next part of this episode, I'm going to be talking a little bit about one of my favorite subjects, orgasms. <laughs> I hope it's one of your favorite subjects too. Back in episode six, I shared the origin story of the Hello Date Night box. And those of you that are on YouTube, you can see it. It's this adorable pink, I like to call it a book boyfriend box. So it comes with a copy of the bad girl list. Ooh, there, it is. Ooh, there it is, super cute. But it doesn't stop there. It's actually the box for your perfect date night. It comes with a sensual rose candle, super cute, with little dried rose petals in it. And it also comes with this discreet pouch that says Hello Date Night. It's a little black silk pouch that says Hello Date Night. And inside is a discreet feminine pleasure toy. One of the things I talked about in episode six, where I talk about the origin of the Hello Date Night box is the importance of owning your orgasm and you should be able to have as many as you'd like anytime that you'd like. And that's part of the reason why I created this box is to empower women. Well, I was on Facebook the other day and I saw this post from a friend of mine. Before I read her post, I wanna tell you a little bit about my friend because she's pretty, pretty amazing. We've been friends for a very long time. We go back to my days of really dabbling in epic fantasy. We were in a writing group together. We met online and we started a writing group together and we've been friends ever since. We both also now write in the romance genre. She's actually been in the romance genre a lot longer than I have. You might recognize her name. Her name is F.R.R. Mallory and she writes erotica, but she writes erotica not like you see most of the time. My friend Mallory writes about Erotica BDSM with dominant females and submissive males. It's very, very cool. So you should definitely check out her books. One of them is called Extreme Space and another one is called Arthur's Secret Life. I'll be sure to link those in the show notes. For sure, check her out. She writes about powerful women. And you know, all of the BDSM books I've ever seen out there are all about dominant men where women have to be submissive. And so I love asking that question, like why does it have to be the woman that's submissive? Is that just because society has taught us that? You know, we're always supposed to be the one on the bottom? I don't know. Anyway, so just something to think about. Definitely check out her books. I love this woman so much. And so she posted this, uh, her New Year's resolution on Facebook. And when I read it, I was so moved by her words and I so deeply resonated with some of the things that she says. Um, so I sent her a message. I'm like, gosh, I loved this post. Would you mind if I read it on my podcast? Because it, ha it has the spirit so much of what I'm going for with this brand and with my Hello Date Night box. And she said, yeah, go for it. So I have it here. She says, I am not a young woman. I say that first to clue people into ageism around the topic of sex. My sole personal New Year's resolution is to set a goal for myself of a particular number of orgasms for the year. If you don't know me well, then you don't know that I have a nonfiction book exploring great sex. As we age, we don't stop having a sexual life, even if we have no partners. And even if we have partners who suffer serious sexual illnesses, perhaps due to health. Sex improves your health, but sex means different things to different people. Whatever your circumstances and health, you are still a sexual being and touch remains critically important to your health. All touch has components that translate into your sexual being even when touch is not intended to convey sexual meaning. Part of staying healthy is to be frontal about your sexual needs. Be intentional. Intimacy is a need like food or water. To manifest healthy experiences, you first have to acknowledge your own needs and to pragmatically think through how to manifest what you think you want or need. Recall that sex isn't intercourse, but a vast spectrum of possible interactions or activities. Explore, talk to people you trust and ask what they are doing as they age. You deserve attention, intimacy, sneaky sex secrets, and to remember you are alive and vital. Set good New Year's goals for yourself. Your life is an adventure you can explore. Ah, oh, 
I just love it. I hope you love this as much as I did. Mallory is just, she's such a powerful woman and I'm so inspired by her. And when I read that, I was just like, yes, yes, you totally captured like what I'm trying, the spirit that I'm trying to embody with this brand and with the Hello Date Night box. Like it's okay to own your bodies. It's okay to have pleasure and, and enjoy yourself and enjoy, enjoy being in these bodies, right? We get these bodies for a limited amount of time and we should be enjoying ourselves. So I was just so moved and I never thought about setting a new year's resolution for the number of orgasms that I'm gonna have in a year. <laughs> But I love that idea. Like maybe we should all do that. I don't, and I have to say, I don't know when this episode's going to air. I'm recording this and I'm, I'm leaving it up to the universe to, to let me know when I should release this episode. So you could be getting this episode in June. I have no idea. <laughs> hey, we could all be setting uh, summer solstice goals, right? For the rest of the year. So uh, maybe that's something we can all do. Set a goal for a number of orgasms we want to have between now and the end of the year. I'm just throwing it out there. Let me know what you think. <laughs> So please, uh, for sure, check out FRR Mallory's books on Amazon. Again, I will link them in the show notes. She has a novel called Extreme Space and another one called The Secret Life of Arthur. And like, embrace your inner goddess, you guys. Like, embrace it. <laughs> you never know where it might lead you. Oh, and I have to say, listening to Mallory's posts like totally inspires me. I talked, it was one or two episodes ago, about a story that dropped in for Gramps, like a romance story for Gramps. And I was asking you like, do you guys want silver haired romances? So now I'm thinking like, ooh, I need to go there. Like, I need to go there. <laughs> I'm feeling so inspired. This is gonna wrap up this episode of the Marie Matthews Show. And as always, you can visit me at mariematthew.com. You can buy autographed copies of the Bad Girl list over there, as well as the Hello Date Night box. And I don't think I've said this before, but all of my prices include shipping. So shipping is free or included in the cost that you see on the website. So there's no extra costs. Um, and I even prepay the tax on my items. So you don't even have to pay sales tax. As always, you can leave comments on YouTube. I try to respond to all of those. And you can always send me uh, an email at romancingmarie at gmail.com. Until next week, have a good one. Own those orgasms. <laughs> uh, and I'll talk to you all soon. Take care. Bye.